Saints of the Americas is a series that seeks to share information on the life and times of the saints of the Catholic Church celebrated in the Americas. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle. Welcome to our show. Now we're going to talk about Maria Kappas, a venerable. Uh, she's from Lithuania uh, and born at a time when it was uh, under uh, rule of Russia. And let's talk about some of those beginnings because uh, the practice of the faith for her was not uh, something that she was able to do uh, publicly. Well, yes, growing, uh, being born into a Catholic family, but as you said, Lithuania under the control of, of Russia. And ever since the time of the Empress Catherine II, it was the state religion was Russian Orthodox. And so it was not acceptable uh, to openly practice uh, the Catholic faith. And so that brought great challenges into her life and the life of her family. Uh, we see then, um, for her, there's this desire uh, to move forward, to be able to practice her faith, to be with her family. Um, her family comes to the United States, but we see that for her, uh, you know, there's not complete contentment. And so there's a desire to go back home, mm -hmm. uh, but then a desire to come back. But one of the things that regardless of whether she was in Lithuania or back in the United States, she wanted to continue to practice her faith. And so we see that there are people in her life, her brother, uh, is one of them that helps set up this opportunity for her to continue to grow and develop in her faith formation, uh, which is something that happens, uh, you know, in a clandestine way while she's back in Lithuania, but then can happen in a more full and, and, and open way when she's back here in the United States. Uh, we do have to note that uh, she was born in 1880 uh, and her name was Casimira Kapos. And so, um, Many of the Lithuanians at the time uh, emigrated to the United States uh, because they could practice freely their, their Catholic mm -hmm. faith. And so we see that, uh, as you had mentioned, her brother uh, becomes a parish priest in the United States. Uh, he invites her to uh, join him in the parish uh, as the housekeeper and basically helping him to serve the Lithuanian Catholics in America at the time. Um, for whatever reason, she becomes homesick. She goes back home, but then four years later, she does return to the United States. And uh, we see this, this um, progression happening, uh, her desire to be more involved, not just as a housekeeper and not just working with Lithuanian Catholics, but to be more involved in the lives of people. And so she begins um, this, this really this congregation uh, of companions in the United States. And let's talk particularly about what that society is and how it got started. Well, we know that uh, in her growing in her, her own faith, she spent some time with a religious community in Switzerland. And then her brother uh, helps her to find another uh, priest, uh, spiritual advisor, mm -hmm. as she comes here. Uh, she's part of another religious community here, uh, the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Scranton, Pennsylvania. But as you said then, um, she moves forward in starting a, a new religious community, the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Casimir. Uh, certainly her uh, patron saint, uh, her name, Casimira, uh, St. Casimir, uh, and she takes the name Maria, uh, in starting this new religious community and joins with a few others in perpetual vows uh, and ultimately is elected their superior. Uh, but it is, as you said, a ministry of companionship, a ministry of service and reaching out uh, to those in need and specifically uh, people that found themselves in the same immigrant situations that she did. You know, it's interesting as we talk about um, immigrants, how important it is uh, for us to uh, help them maintain uh, their Catholic faith and to serve them. We know in, in our country, uh, we do have many immigrants from different parts of the world, in particular from Latin America, South America, um, Central America, and how important it is for us to minister to them, uh, especially in their own language, so they understand 
uh, the, the doctrines of the faith, but also can live their faith comfortably and be able to um, share that faith with their own children. And we certainly see this in the life of, uh, of Mother Maria Kappas, where she uh, ministered to those of her own background, of her own ethnic background, the Lithuanians, and continued to uh, lift them up uh, in this community that she founded, which eventually uh, she, she had for 27 years prior to her death, uh, which grew into 340 sisters and 30 houses uh, around the country. And so we saw this kind of burgeoning of her own community uh, named after her patron saint, St. Casimir. Uh, let's talk about um, the church in, uh, in uh, countries where they are not able to publicly practice their faith and what we can do for those people in those situations. Well, I think first, the first thing we can do is to have a deep appreciation and understanding mm -hmm. what it must be for. I think we, um, we take so much for granted the freedoms that we do have. Uh, you know, sadly, the freedom to wake up on a Sunday morning and decide not to go to church as much as to decide to go. Uh, that that becomes our freedom and that there are so many people who are longing to be able to practice their faith around the globe who in this day and age in 2018 cannot practice their faith. Uh, we see that that has changed uh, the circumstances and countries over time. Certainly uh, for Maria it was Lithuania uh, which brought her here and then as you mentioned uh, how it grew throughout the country, but we see she moved from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and then from Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania, uh, to Chicago, where there was the largest concentration of, of Lithuanians who left, partly because they wanted to be able to practice their faith. Um, in our current age, we see it in China, and we see it in other parts of, of the globe. But for us who have that freedom of practice our faith, first to be in solidarity with people, and then in whatever ways we're asked, through prayer, through um, contributions, uh, through support, to, to reach out to our brothers and sisters that we are united to in faith, uh, who have a desire to practice their faith. We know that um, uh, at the age of 53, uh, Mother Maria contracted breast cancer and lived with that um, disease, which eventually uh, advanced into bone cancer. And she survived uh, to the age of 60 and died in 1940. And so her 60 short years of life uh, was spent uh, serving those people like herself uh, who were not able to practice their faith um, wholly and freely in their country, but came to uh, the United States where they knew that they could practice. And so she, in her uh, sickness, illness, uh, continued to uh, share the faith and celebrate the faith uh, with her Lithuanian friends and, and uh, co-workers. And so we, uh, as we do talk about these saints, we encourage the folks that are with us to, um, through the internet, to go back to uh, the saints we talk about to find out more information. We only give you a smattering of information. Uh, but we're going to talk about another saint in a moment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book called Saints of the USA by Brother Marco Bucarelli. This book for children ages six and up will fascinate young readers as they learn more about the saints of North America. Those who read it will meet 10 figures who have lived lives of holiness, as well as the Immaculate Conception of Mary, patroness of the United States. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts, at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224. The store is open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953-2443 or email at stpaulsbookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these saints of our time. I am Mary Noel. Yo soy Mary Noel. Mary Noel, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Missioners, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Mary Noel. I'm Father Mike, and I am Mary Noel. 
I am Merino. 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 Welcome back to the show. We're going to talk now about Venerable Maria Luisa Josefa. Uh, she is Mexican and she's a Carmelite community, uh, but also lives in a time where there was a, an anti-Catholic um, sense of uh, what was going on in Mexico at the time. And so um, there was uh, unrest. There was also um, confiscation of church property. Uh, many of priests and religious were exiled because of the Catholic faith. And we find her in this setting. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about um, uh, Maria Luisa. Well, it's worth noting she came from a certain life of privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that her parents owned a, a very large parcel of land uh, about 50 miles outside of Guadalajara. Uh, she was well taken care of by her family, they loved her, uh, but it was also at a time, especially in the Mexican culture, as is in true of many right. uh, cultures of the time, that uh, the young girl would be raised and groomed to get married. The parents would select the husband for her. We know that when she's 15, they choose what they believe to be a well-suited husband for her. He's uh, twice her age, he's 30, uh, but he's a physician, and so there's a certain sense of wealth and prominence there. Uh, they do marry. Uh, now, we're given no understanding that it's not a, a marriage that has love uh, in it. They stay together. But we do know that after 14 years of marriage, uh, no children are produced from it. They are unable to have children. And her husband, Pasquale, dies. Uh, we know that after his death, she desi desires then to fulfill what she really wanted to do with her life in an, in an early age, and that is to become a religious sister. And so as a widow and as many um, widows, especially women of some prominence and wealth, uh, she decides to enter uh, the Carmelites of St. Teresa at Guadalajara. And it's there that she takes the religious name Maria. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, those young people um, uh, throughout time in history who, because of culture or custom, uh, where there was arranged marriages and so forth, that uh, someone may have been thinking about wanting to be a priest or uh, a, a, a sister and did not because they were adhering to the demands of the culture or uh, the desires of the family or to carry on uh, the royal name. Uh, and yet we see uh, her, uh, you know, adhering to, to her parents' wishes and the culture's wishes. But then the opportunity comes because this was a lifelong desire for her to become a nun. And so she enters uh, this community and um, several years later, we see that there's other women who join this uh, Carmelite community that she is part of because they join her mission and desire to, um, uh, to, serve, uh, to serve the poor. And we also see that um, uh, this bishop who's involved in uh, creating this order and encouraging her and the other uh, women to be part of this is to uh, basically open a school for poor girls and uh, volunteers uh, to do these, these uh, situations. And so what particular um, ministry would we see uh, Maria Luisa engage in? And what would be something that would have been available for her at the time uh, to become part of? Well, certainly, as you said, uh, the bishop at the time, uh, recognizing her and these women, uh, even as to have said to them, you're living like a group of religious women, so you should become a group of religious women. And so from leaving the Carmelites, and we'll get to why she left the Carmelites in a moment, uh, but she does later on then, uh, with the women that are with her, mm -hmm. form a new religious community, the Sister Servants of the Blessed Sacrament. And as you said, a school for poor girls is certainly part of that ministry, but uh, what's very interesting about Maria's life is, and something that she could never fully escape, really goes back to the work that her and her husband had established, which was the founding of a hospital. And we see that no less than three times in Maria's life, when she leaves the leadership of that hospital, mm -hmm. of that serving the poor and the sick, it flounders without her. Mm -hmm. uh, when her husband dies and she joins the Carmelites and legitimately leaves the leadership, mm -hmm. it flounders. 
And it's the encouragement then of the, the bishop at that time for her to go back to that. Mm-hmm. Once she thinks she's got it up and running, she leaves then with these group of women and they start a school, they start the religious community. And again, the hospital flounders. Um, so what I, what I think is very important in that, um, I don't want us to learn the lesson that we might think, well, without me, this can't happen. That certainly wasn't what Maria thought. Maria herself wanted to continue to move and, and go forward in other ministries. What I think it really is saying is that we have to be open to what we are being called to do. Sometimes we are not the best person at judging our gifts. We might want to be able to do something else or go somewhere else, or even as a, a priest, I've always wanted to be at that parish, or as a, as a sister, I always wanted to run that school, or as, as an employee, I always wanted that job at the company, or I wanted to marry him or her. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes God certainly has other directions for us. And what Maria did was time and time again, she allowed herself to be open to what God wanted her to do. And I think that's her great calling for us. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we see her uh, in this particular role in ministering uh, to, uh, to young girls in the education field, but also uh, to the poor in the hospital situation. But then we see her going then to Los Angeles to start another foundation with her community. And then eventually she returns back to Mexico um, where um, the president at the time um, was overthrown and she returns then back to the United States. So there's this constant desire to return home, but then she comes back and uh, whatever she is doing, uh, she works until her death uh, in 1937. So for 71 years, uh, she labors doing the things that she's wanted to do. Um, and, and when we see uh, these, these people elevated to the lives of the saints, uh, they're not necessarily people that have been um, uh, saints all their lives, but this is a woman who was a wife, who was a mother, or not a mother, but a wife, a widow, uh, someone who um, becomes a foundress of religious community. So she kind of like uh, has the gamut of responsibility. Um, and so ultimately, as you had mentioned, she's all about doing what God's will is. And that's what we celebrate for her, uh, Venerable Maria Luisa Josefa. Uh, stay with us. We'll talk about another saint in a moment. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book on Louis and Zelie Martin, parents of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. The book focuses on her parents' journey towards sanctity and their family life and social commitments. This book was compiled for couple and group sharing and is meant to strengthen the journey of all in marriage and family life towards sanctity and holiness. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224, located across from the Olive Garden Restaurant. The stores open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953-2443 or email at stpaulsbookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these witnesses of our time. I am Marinol. Je suis Marinol. I am Marinol. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that it is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Marinol, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Marinol dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missioners, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marinol. I am Marinol. Yo soy Marinol. I'm Father Mike, and I am Marinol. I am Mary no. 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 My name is Sister Mary Claudina and I run a home for abandoned children. I want to take care of children who have no parents because luckily I come from a very loving family. There are, there are eight of us. 
We learn to care for each other, to love each other, to fight among each other, just to be a family. And I think that's what I, um, I learned from home and I wanted to, to share that with children who do not have that opportunity. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Welcome back to our show. Now we're going to talk about Blessed Miriam Teresa Demjanovic. Um, she died very young at the age of 26. Uh, those who have read her life and understood it uh, relate to her like they do of Teresa Lisieux, who also died at a young age. Um, she was very sickly. We'll talk a little bit about that. But what um, brings her to this, this desire to be a religious sister? And uh, where would she have gotten that? Well, she's born at the turn of the 20th century in New Jersey. Uh, but her family were immigrants from Slovakia. Uh, so again, we see uh, a large family. She is uh, the youngest of seven children. Um, when she graduates from high school, however, uh, at the age of 16, her mother is very ill. Um, so while you might think that in most families the baby of the family is pampered or spoiled, what would have been the case in these families is that by being the youngest at that age, all of the others are already married off and are living their lives. And so the only child left is the one who can care for uh, the mother. We know that she cares for her mother for two years before her mother ultimately dies. Uh, so that's kind of putting her life on hold uh, for a while. Uh, she finally then enters the College of St. Elizabeth in uh, Morristown, New Jersey, and it's operated by the Sisters of Charity. And so there she uh, excels scholastically, but also is exposed to the work of the sisters. And uh, all of that kind of comes together to uh, motivate her to join the sisters and uh, be part of their academic pursuits. Let's talk a little bit about her, uh, her young life. Uh, we know that she is a really a scholar, someone who graduated, you mentioned summa cum laude. So she understands um, many things and she's seeking uh, this, uh, this uh, entrance into a religious community, but also we understand that she is very sickly. She has poor eyesight. Uh, she um, experiences some other physical um, uh, frailties. And so they decide to encourage her to become part of the Carmelites who would have taken uh, people uh, that would have had these uh, physical disabilities uh, into their fold. And so um, it's, it's something that uh, she didn't want to do. She really wanted to join the Sisters of Charity. And so she continues uh, this pursuit. And uh, this happens uh, late in 1924, where she applied to the Sisters of Charity uh, in New Jersey, and she was uh, finally accepted. Um, she was to enter the order um, on February 2nd in 1925, but her father caught a cold and then eventually died. Uh, so her entrance really was postponed until later uh, that month. And so she eventually becomes a postulant and she takes on the name of Miriam. And so that is her religious name. Uh, we also see that she has a, a spiritual advisor and how important probably was it for her to have a spiritual advisor, and what did this spiritual advisor help her do? Well, certainly coming from a, a, a childhood where uh, her mother dies, and as we see mm -hmm. shortly before she enters the, the community, her father dies. So there is that sense of maybe being abandoned by those who would be her guide, who would be uh, those to kind of help her along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly even in a religious community, um, the experiences she had perhaps if we can look in a little psychologically into this, of wanting to be part of a community who says to you, well, we really don't want you. Uh, you don't make the grade for us, but here's this other community. And then ultimately working very hard, being very academically gifted and finally getting there. All of these things are playing into the fact that she really would have craved and needed someone 
uh, to offer her that guidance, to help her recognize her talents. And, and this isn't just because of the extraordinary circumstances of, of her life. We're all in need of that one person who perhaps can put things into perspective for us and, and help us see things in a different light. Um, sometimes we get so consumed with our own view and our own understanding. It's, it's kind of like proofreading your own paper. You don't notice your mistakes. And then you hand it to someone else and you're shocked that they're circling, oh, you did this. Because we're so consumed in our own work, we don't see anything other than what we've already put there. And so that spiritual director would help her to expand and to understand. And, and we see as a, as a young sister that uh, her frailties continue to, to grow. She continues to uh, be more ill and uh, experiences uh, what eventually takes her life. But then we see um, not a lot of um, compassion coming from her religious superior who basically said, you know, kind of get your act together. Maybe this illness that you have really isn't an illness at all. And um, as she seeks advice from her um, spiritual advisor, uh, she says, Father, you know, for a long time I've tried to do this, but there's nothing there for me to get my act together, so to speak. Uh, and so when they finally realize how sick she is, um, they, uh, they notified her brother uh, who called uh, a nurse uh, who was a sister to see her. And so they basically took her to the hospital where she's diagnosed with physical and um, nervous exhaustion and has um, other uh, frailties and uh, physical problems. And the doctors obviously didn't think uh, that she was going to make it. And so they've asked, uh, she's asked to have her final profession. And so that was, uh, that was granted. And she then died on May 8th, uh, 1927. And what does uh, Father Benedict basically say about her uh, after her death? After he, he told the community at conferences that he would give uh, that uh, the writings, um, what were uh, written down by uh, Sister Miriam, are of great importance, uh, perhaps very similar to what we experienced with um, Therese of Lisieux, just those little ways of how one would want to live their life. And because of what he then conveys, the community immediately recognizes there's a spiritual maturity there. Um, while she was seen as as being too young to be sick. And that's really what her superiors thought. They, they thought, you're too young to be yeah. sick. This can't be real. Pull yourself together. Um, she was still very young, but there was a maturity in her spiritual awareness, in her uh, love of God. And so he puts that all together in a book that he calls Greater Perfection. And then ultimately, he is the one, uh, this, this priest, who starts to... Uh, Get the ball rolling for her canonization process. And we know that she was uh, the first to be beatified in the United States and that took place uh, in Newark, New Jersey on October 4th, 2014 uh, and her feast day is on May 8th. Uh, thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Saints of the Americas was a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program hosts were Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle.